far we've looked at uh, the importance of having a strong biblical foundation first and foremost. Uh, if there's anything that you could take away from our church and from our teaching here is that uh, more important than man's opinion, more important than good charismatic personality is the fact that uh, the Bible has to serve as uh, our foundation for truth. Amen. That led us down the road of examining, uh, kind of coming to this, maybe not so much of a realization for most of us, but uh, maybe a definition if you will, of the fact that the majority of cultural Christianity is not actually Christianity at all. Um, we look at our society, we look at our nation, and there are plenty of Christians that exist that are Christians in name only. Uh, we would call them nominal Christians. And we kind of looked at what sociologists describe as moral therapeutic deism, to give some sort of definition to what we see in our society. We, we really examine that as a groundwork, as a framework for a lot of what passes as Christianity in our culture and realizing that it's not actually Christianity at all. And so uh, lastly, the last kind of endeavor into this little teaching series we've been on, uh, we looked at uh, the doctrine of universal salvation universal salvation. We really explored what Christian universalism looks like and how it's kind of permeating uh, different uh, trains of thought within Christianity and really exposed it um, for being a dangerous heresy. That There's real ramifications that exist in the acceptance of universal salvation and universalism. And those are just some of the, like, the minor little, like, you know, lightweight, happy topics that we've been tackling over the last number of weeks. And I want to encourage you, if you missed any of those and you're like, oh, I want to hear, uh, hear what, the, what the scriptures have to say about those topics, uh, we do have a podcast. Uh, we don't have last week's message up on the podcast because we had some technical difficulties, but uh, the majority of our messages, we do our best to record them and put them on our website and put them on our podcast and would encourage and invite you guys to uh, stay in tune with what uh, the Lord's teaching us here in Scripture if you ever want to go and backtrack and follow those things around. But if, uh, if there was one verse or, I guess, a, a passage of Scripture, if you will, that's kind of been foundational in this teaching that has really, uh, has really kind of been grounding for us, it's been 2 Timothy chapter 4, four verses 1 through 5. And this is Paul's charge to Timothy. Um, it's one minister's charge to the next generation of minister uh, rising up in his footsteps. And this is, this is what he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. We did a kind of a deeper dive into this passage of scripture in that first uh, teaching that I did in this series in regards to the, just the foundation of the word of God. But I really, I really look at this charge that's given to Timothy and really embrace it for myself as a pastor that this is my duty, if you will, um, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who really is going to come and judge the world. And it's first and foremost that I would preach the word, but that I would convince, that I would rebuke, that I would exhort. It's not one of coddling. It's not one of just approving everything that's going on in your life. But the purpose of a pastor the purpose of one that preaches the word of God is one that would bring forth truth, not just the truth you want to hear. Does that make sense? And as much as I would like to be the guy that everybody likes, that everybody agrees with, that everybody pats on the back and you know shares what I have to say on Facebook, 
I have to, I have to come to the, 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 the heavy realization that that reality is not for me um, because I understand that what God has to say is very important. And so I want to be clear. My aim this morning is to not alienate or demonize any particular group of people. I really do want to have an honest conversation. And uh, this morning, we're going to jump into uh, tackling a pretty polarizing topic for a lot of people. But we're going to begin to talk about the church's role um, in the LGBTQ movement. And so uh, there's a lot of different emotions that rise up with that. There's a lot of different thoughts. And I can very easily see how easy it would be for the enemy to kind of weaponize comments or take things out of context and really use this in a divisive nature. Um, so I want to say this, if, if anyone here or anyone listening or watching, you fall into this category of uh, you know, being pro-LGBTQ in, in some sort of sense, maybe you're gay or bi or you fit somewhere else into that acronym, um, I want to be, first and foremost, that this is an invitation to a larger conversation than just what's going to be talked about here on a Sunday morning. I don't have time to thoroughly exhaust the nuance and go into all the different aspects of the church's response to the, the kind of enormous issue that is in our society today. Um, and I want you guys to know that I'm open and available to talk about these things, and I want to. I want to have meaning discussion, meaningful discussion that's beyond just preaching from a microphone. Um, but I have to make that disclaimer because right now our culture, uh, and especially with LGBTQ issues, is extremely polarized. Can we, can we think of a, a more weaponized topic? I, I, I really, I struggle to find one right now. Um, and I have found it almost, and I say almost because I've had a few, but almost impossible to have legitimate discussion regarding these issues, um, especially with people that I disagree with. I don't know if you guys have encountered this, but upon expressing disapproval, anything else that I have to say um, most of the time becomes irrelevant and invalidated. And so while today I hold probably a wildly unpopular opinion with much of what culture would deem appropriate, um, I believe it's something that it's important for the church to be alert about. Uh, I, I do think that tolerance is not a two-way street anymore. I don't know if you guys have encountered this or if you experienced this. Um, I don't think it ever was, to be 100% honest. Um, and that shouldn't surprise us. And so I'm going to use some language. I'm going to uh, do my best to try to um, be somewhat politically correct, not as an aim, but I do understand that some of the things that Jesus has to say are, is already offensive enough that it doesn't need kind of my personality overlaid on top of it, um, if that makes any sense. Right now, guys, to be an ally, if you will, to the LGBTQ, I think I'm saying that right, movement is uh, pretty popular, right? To put rainbow flags out on your place of business or to sell t-shirts that say love is love and all this different stuff and deck everything out in a rainbow is kind of the popular thing to do. When I was with Adam and Shelby, I was uh, up at the hospital get, going to get you guys food and uh, every establishment that I visited, seriously, I can say this, I, every restaurant that I went to had some sort of uh, promotion of the LGBTQ movement and pride month, if you will. Initially, this, this uh, teaching was going to uh, be at the end of pride month. I was really kind of excited with how I mapped and planned things out. Didn't happen, whatever, it's July. I don't know what happened to June. It went by really fast. Anybody feel that way? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I want to be, I want to be clear. And can we, can we just have a, like an honest conversation here? I think Adam and I were talking about it, but these corporations and these businesses, I really don't feel like are really like trying to promote some sense of equality. I, I personally feel like the majority of them are just kind of chasing after some side of dollar sign, 
if we could be honest. <laughs> There's a lot of money to be had in this LGBTQ agenda. And uh, as much as I would like to think that, you know, people are more altruistic than that, uh, the reality is I think a lot of people are just following the money. And right now, to be, uh, to be gay is popular or to be supportive of gay culture or LGBTQ stuff, it's the popular thing to do. Every, every major brand that exists has a rainbow version of their logo that exists, and it's not because they all, all of a sudden are like, ooh, we care about everybody. I think it's, oh, we're gonna pretend to care about everybody because that's what makes us money. And that's reality of a lot of our culture and is probably a greater indication of the issue of pride and greed that exists that we could talk about in a little bit when we get to talking about some sin stuff. But I'm saying this because I believe popularity is a poor judge of truth. And in fact, I think more often than not, popularity is an indicator that something is actually amiss. You see, tolerance of one another is no longer the goal, and I don't think it ever was. <laughs> Acceptance of an individual is no longer enough. It's translated over into demanded approval of behavior. You see, we've had a number of people, and this is where uh, this fits into the, the kind of the realm of heresies and half-truths, is uh, my experience with the church and encountering those in the, the sphere of the LGBTQ. But we've had a number of individuals that have found themselves here at our church by doing a, a quick Google search or whatnot. Um, I, I don't know if it's the, the idea. We were showing up on a list of um, affirming, gay affirming churches um, for a while. And I don't really know how we got on there or where we came from or if we were confused maybe with a different open door church somewhere else. Um, but we've had a number of individuals kind of grace our door um, for finding us on the internet or just because uh, they thought we were welcoming or approving or, or these different things. And I would like to be the first to tell you we've had a lot of uh, really awesome encounters with individuals that were living in this lifestyle that encountered Jesus and their lives were transformed. We've also had the other kind of answer to that. They find out that we're not an affirming, oh, spoiler alert, I was going to get to that, uh, that we're not an affirming uh, a church that's condoning of uh, homosexual activity and behavior. Um, and, you know, they get offended and they, get, and they leave. Um, we've experienced both sides of those spectrums. But uh, the reality is... Um, I'm not trying to highlight what's wrong with, uh, with people and homosexuality. I'm not trying to preach a message this morning to convince you that being gay is wrong or, or anything like that in, in kind of connection with heresy, in connection with false teaching, in connection with things that are dangerous for the Christian to believe. Uh, I want to talk about the modern rise of affirmation within Christian circles. That's really my heart this morning about what we're talking about. Because I, I say this, to embrace and welcome people within the LGBTQ movement is not the same as affirmation. It's not the same as affirming sin. And we've experienced both sides of those spectrum. I always want to be welcoming to anyone whoever they might be, however they might identify, whatever they might have going on in their lives. I want to be welcoming. I want to be embracing of those individuals and those people. But I cannot cross the line into affirming that what God says is wrong is okay. And the reality is, I believe a number of people, in, in maybe even in good intention, wanting to model the love of Christ, have misconstrued what it means to affirm and love someone, right? I love my children, but that doesn't mean I approve of everything they do, right? I have friends that I love, but that doesn't mean that I approve of all of their life decisions. In fact, my good friend Daniel, uh, you guys know him, he was a pastor here. Uh, you know, I love him immensely. 
And, you know, there was a, a number of years ago, not his wife currently, but he was dating an individual and they were engaged to be married. And he sat down and asked me, like, what do you think about this? And he asked a number of us, a number of his close friends, and we, we told him some hard things that he probably didn't want to hear, but ultimately wound up working out very well for him. And uh, I say this because we understand that to love someone doesn't always mean telling them what they want to hear. Does that make sense? And that's where I believe Christianity and culture is divided on the definition of love. And so... Why are we making a big deal about homosexuality? Why are we making a big deal about the LGBTQ? Um, My attempt this morning is not to convince you that homosexuality is wrong. I believe that scripture uh, is pretty darn clear on that in a number of places. But just just for one example this morning, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10, and 11 because it's going to help us make a couple more points that I think are going to be very important for us going forward. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I want you to be very clear here. It does not say, do you not know that gay people will not inherit the kingdom of God? It doesn't say, do you not know that trans people will not inherit the kingdom of God? It goes on to say this. It says the unrighteous. It's kind of a, it's kind of a canopy term, if you will. But Underneath that term of unrighteous, we get a kind of a broader definition of what he's actually talking about here. He says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, that's talking about heterosexual and homosexual fornicators, nor idolaters, that's talking about heterosexual and homosexual idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous. Oh, whoa, we're talking about covetous people here? Nor drunkards? Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) This is talking about both straight and gay drunkards. Nor revilers, nor extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's not me. That's not my bigoted talk here speaking. That is the word of God telling us that none of these people are going to inherit the kingdom of God. But it goes on with good, uh, good, uh, good news here in verse 11. It says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There's good hope for those that used to be drunkards. There's good hope, uh, or even if you still are, uh, of, of being covetous, of being a thief, of being homosexual, or, or being an adulterer, an idolater, or a fornicator. All of these things that are bad, <laughs> that Scripture defines as bad, that God does not approve of. Uh, he has made provision for change, namely in and of himself. So why am I not preaching about covetousness or drunkenness this morning? Why am I not tackling uh, thievery or idolatry or adultery or these other kind of big ticket items that are lumped together here with homosexuality? I, I'm not here to try to make out homosexuality to be a worse sin than any one of these other things. It's not just to kind of try to demonize people within this movement or, or, or people that identify this way. But the reality is, um, one, the reality is that there are far more people that are probably going to wind up in hell for being covetous be, be, be of... of uh, uh, of covetousness, there you go, that's word, <laughs> English, something like that. It's not like one that we just throw around every day. Um, but there's a lot of more people that are probably going to wind up in hell for being greedy and for being drunkards than there are for practicing homosexuality. I'm saying that just statistically. Uh, the end result, though, is that people wind up in hell because of sin, not just your particular flavor of it. So why am I making a big deal about homosexuality? Why am I making a big deal about the LGBTQ plus uh, movement right now? Well, um, I think, to be honest, uh, I didn't see a, a month-long celebration for, you know, Greed Pride Month. I didn't see a month-long celebration of people like celebrating adultery or, you know, drunkenness. 
even though it kind of low-key exists all the time in our media. But, you know, I'm not seeing that uh, kind of perpetually attack families and now children in some sort of indoctrination. I'm not saying that it doesn't. It definitely exists. But it seems like uh, right now the LGBTQ uh, agenda, if you will, is largely militarized and it's definitely an affront on people for us to accept it. You know, nobody's making the argument that we should accept drunkenness. Nobody's making the argument that we should accept adultery and fornication, or I, some people probably are, but, you know, the, the overwhelming kind of thing is not for us to accept murder or, or these other terrible injustices, but the, the kind of the forefront of the conversation is that we would be acceptive and affirming of uh, the LGBTQ agenda, and I think we ought to talk about it. I think that it is a big deal. And so I guess one, um, maybe I should preach messages on covetness and covetousness, covet, covet, that, maybe I should learn how to say that word before I preach a message on it. Um, <laughs> maybe I should preach a message on drunkenness and alcohol, right? I'm not that popular anyway, so what's another one? Uh, <laughs> let, maybe let's do it. But there just isn't, I, I don't see the same celebration regarding a lot of these other things mentioned in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I'm not saying that there's not celebration out there. I just don't see it rallied behind with entire months and kind of social justice movements to try to get us to accept it, embrace it, and celebrate it. Um, and uh, I guess in particularly surrounding LGBTQ issues, um, my great concern is that the church of Jesus Christ has moved past just, you know, tolerating or embracing people, but it's moved into condoning and full out uh, affirmation of such things. You know, just this morning I went and kind of looked in, I was trying to look for churches around us, and there's, there's a website called gaychurch.com that you can go to, and it'll bring up a whole list of welcoming and affirming churches within your area. And entire denominations have gone down this path. Entire, uh, once biblically sound, mighty moves of God are now uh, following in these footsteps of our culture. And I want to be very clear when I say that any church that affirms any sinful lifestyle, please hear me, any sinful lifestyle, be it homosexual or heterosexual or any other thing, it is no longer the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that with everything inside of me. And so while maybe at the, the, the top of this kind of discussion this morning, we're looking at LGBTQ kind of stuff, but I believe it paints a bigger, broader picture for a church that affirms sin. And that's a dangerous thing. Um, I believe it's a big deal. And I'm afraid of a church in which sin is no longer a big deal. Because a church that deviates from Scripture to make way to justify sin is completely contradictory to what Jesus came to do, right? We understand that in Matthew, uh, at the announcement of Jesus' birth or his, his coming, uh, you know, that his main reason for coming was to save his people from his sins. We read that in the very first chapter of Matthew. Not to continue in them. Uh, very clearly, I believe uh, as a church, we're to be a come-as-you-are kind of church. <laughs> if you're messed up, I want to say you're in good company here. <laughs> it's uh, None of us are without sin. None of us are without our past. None of us are without our problems. But we are not a come-as-you-are, stay-as-you-are kind of church because we don't serve a come-as-you-are, stay-as-you-are kind of Jesus. And I believe where the affirming church... Uh, really differs and really begins to deviate in, in terms of love and compassion is they want to love you as you are, but they feel like to love you as you are, you don't have to change. And I 100% believe that Jesus loves each and every person as they are, but with the expectation and providing the potential for life change to come about. 
You see First uh, Peter 2.24. If you guys want to put that one up on the screen. It says this about Jesus. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. This, uh, I think, is a beautiful kind of definition of what happens at salvation, of what's happened with our sin. We see Jesus himself boring our sins upon his body on the cross. We see him dying, the God of all the universe dying. It's what we remembered when we took communion here just a minute ago, uh, that he himself took our sin upon him on the cross. That, uh, and that we, having died to sins, that we're to die to our sinful nature, that we might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. The way that we do this is through what Jesus did on the cross. And you see, the sin of homosexuality is not too different from other sins that we face in the fact that they all bring forth death. Right? We, we understand that, that there's, all, there's judgment that's coming for sin. We need to die to gluttony, to drunkenness, to covetousness. Covet, covet, oh my gosh, why can't, covetousness, right? Covetousness. Covet. I just wrote all this down wrong and I'm reading it wrong. Covetousness. I feel like I'm cursing or I'm swearing when I say that. One of these days I'll get it right. You know what I'm talking about. Stop eyeing your neighbor's donkey that way. Uh, anyway, now everybody's just confused. Um, <laughs> ooh, um, we need to die to our sins much in the same way that those that practice homosexuality need to die to their sins. It's not just this kind of elevation of their sin is worse than our sin. Uh, I believe the call to follow Jesus is to die to sin, that we might live for righteousness, and we do this through what Jesus did on the cross. And this is why I have an issue with affirming churches or affirming Christians, because we give people permission to live how they want, no longer allowing God to decide right from wrong, but individuals, emotions, and feelings. It's uh, one of the aspects, one of the pillars of moral therapeutic deism that we talked about another couple of weeks ago. God is no longer determined what's right and wrong. He's no longer allowed to tell you what to do. And this is really kind of the big issue that we have um, within our culture is that nobody wants to be told what to do anymore, right? We're not allowed to tell people that they're wrong. We're not allowed to tell people that they're, they're completely off base because there isn't a, an Another, there isn't a superior guide for morality anymore. You become the center of your own reality and you determine right from wrong. You determine what's right for you rather than uh, something that's not flawed and something that's not broken. And that's the great kind of debacle that we're in right now. And so the question I believe is raised, is it possible that sinful, broken humanity approves and celebrates something that God actually says he hates. That's the big issue here when it comes to any sin. And that's why I can't get behind an affirming belief or an affirming church or an affirming culture that says, well, you're this way and so your sin's okay and we've got to come alongside of you. Um, I believe that at first, at the very beginning, we need to ask the question, of God, what do you say about whatever it is he wants to say anything about? I say, I wrote this down, and you guys have heard me quote charger, uh, charges. I don't know who charges is, but Charles Spurgeon before. Um, and I often quote him where he says, too many think lightly of sin and therefore think lightly of their Savior. I want to go in and just read the, the whole context of this quote because I believe it's just equally as powerful because he goes on to say, that too many think lightly of sin and therefore think lightly of the Savior. He who has stood before his God, convicted and condemned, with a rope about his neck, is the man to weep for joy when he is pardoned, to hate the evil which, he has, been, which has been forgiven him, and to live to the honor of the Redeemer by whose blood he has been cleansed. 
Friends, I believe as a church, I believe as the church of Jesus Christ, we can never make too big of a deal about sin. I say this not in the, not in the sense of where we just go on a witch hunt and, and we just try to call people out for their sin and, and just tell everybody what they're doing is wrong. But when we, when we just kind of overlook it and it's no longer a big deal to us and it's no longer that causes us to grieve, it's no longer something that, that stirs about our response in our spirit, friends, I, I believe we're diminishing the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. We know kind of the crux of the LGBTQ movement uh, is identity, right? That's kind of the outcry for everybody. This is who I am. You can't come against who I am. You can't come against my identity. It's about living out your true self, being true to what you feel and who you are. Friends, can I tell you that's essentially the antithesis of what uh, Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23? this message of self-denial that Jesus would call us to. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, 23, that Jesus called to his disciples. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, I believe that the, the affirming church or affirming Christians, if you will, undermine the wonderful gift of regeneration that we're to experience when we encounter Jesus. You see, the common argument that I hear a lot and that you probably have encountered um, is that if that people are born this way, right? I, I was born this way. I was born gay. I was born trans. I was born uh, a different gender than I now identify as, all these different things. Um, and while I'm not saying I agree with that sentiment, even if that was the case, even if that was the reality, Jesus tells us that we must actually be born again. There's this regenerative work that Jesus does when we come to him, not just for the homosexual, not just for the one that identifies as a different gender, but for all humanity that is broken in sin. He does a regenerative work where he calls us to be born again. Where we're to be born again by the Spirit. Jesus, in John 3, he says in John 3, 3, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And he would go on and tell us about how we have to be born of spirit as well. Could you imagine if we used the excuse we were just born this way to justify the other sins kind of listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 or, or anywhere else throughout the New Testament? You know, it's like, oh man, I got angry at my neighbor and I just murdered him. And somebody was like, whoa, you can't do that, dude. It's like, oh, it's okay, man, I was just born this way. I was born angry. Right? That would be absurd. And I'm not saying that this is, the, the, this is kind of the argument that the LGBTQ is making for its advancement of, of people or, or their rights or anything like that. What I am saying, this is um, what a lot of the affirming church is kind of proclaiming as their argument. But it would be absurd, right? I was born this way. No, we're all born broken, <laughs> We're all born into a world of sin and we all need the change that Jesus Christ brings. And so if I had one kind of big takeaway this morning, it would be that I would encourage you to be extremely cautious, to be wary, to turn off <laughs> any teaching of any church, of any ministry, of any minister that is affirming of your sin. Because the call of a true man or woman of God is not one to, to preach you into comfort and stability and that your mess and your sin is okay or it's no big deal. But rather, by way of the Holy Spirit, run to the cross where Jesus will effectively deal with your sin, not just comfort you in it. Because I don't believe they represent the heart of a God that loves his children Last week I shared, uh, I shared out of Revelation chapter 3 where we were looking at uh, the church in Laodicea talking about indifference. And in the same verse where, where, he, where he tells you to be zealous and repent, <laughs> to turn your heart away from indifference, he says this, as many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. Revelation 3.19. And so 
I hope you guys understand uh, my message today is not just one of condemnation for those in the LGBTQ kind of movement. That's really not the heart of my message this morning. That's not really the discussion I'm trying to have. Um, and to be honest, I have really zero uh, expectation for the rest of the world to live like it's saved when they haven't encountered Jesus, if that makes sense. I don't have my expectation for the gay person that I meet out uh, just playing Frisbee or something like that or hanging out uh, in, in regular life is entirely different than I have for the for the, the homosexual that meets Jesus and wants to identify as a Christian. I believe that there are entirely different responses to be had based upon those that are inside and outside of the church. I believe that we're to be loving and welcoming 100%, but I do not believe that according to Scripture and our charge and mandate before God that we're to be affirming of anybody's lifestyle that is sinful. And I'm not here to kind of just demonize anybody or try to like uh, pick on other sins be it more than another. But the reality is um, my expectation is just wildly different for those inside and outside of the church. I'm not interested in necessarily trying to implement some kind of Christian theocracy that just makes sin illegal. Uh, we understand that just making sin illegal doesn't really change the heart condition. You guys are tracking with me with that, right? Like we look at ancient Israel, sin was illegal for them and they still sinned. Like there was still an issue to be had. That's why Jesus had to come. Um, people it still didn't go good for them. And I'm not here trying to say, oh, let's abandon every, uh, let's abandon politics and abandon every, everything as a nation or something like that. But when talking about individuals and particularly when talking about the church and the church's role in response to these issues, I have to be very clear that I don't believe that we can, uh, that we can live in a place of affirmation of those that are living in active sin, regardless of whatever that particular sin might be. And so uh, I feel like a great example of this is found in Revelation chapter 2. This is where we're going to close. But in, in 2.18, we see Jesus tell the church in Thyatira, I can say Thyatira, but I can't say covetousness, whatever. <laughs> we'll get there someday. Um, I'm going to practice all week long. It's going to be great. I'll get flashcards. That'll be, that'll be awesome. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this is what Jesus says to the church in Thyatira. He says, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your servants, your service and perseverance, and that you are doing now more than you did at first. It sounds like they're doing a good job, right? It sounds like, oh man, Jesus is like giving them an A+. Plus. Boom, thumbs up. Way to go, church in Thyatira. He says, after this, though, nevertheless, nevertheless, meaning in spite of all that, that's all good, but really, at the end of the day, it's worthless because he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate. Notice the, notice the, the language here used of tolerate. <laughs> you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds." Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father, I also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I realize, friends, at first 
uh, at a cursory glance here, it may not seem entirely relevant to what we're speaking about this morning. But when I look at this woman, Jezebel, when I look at this toleration of her teachings, what I see here is a church, the legitimate church of Jesus Christ, who starts off well, but doesn't finish super strong. <laughs> right? That's what we see at the end. It's, it's there that uh, in verse 26, he says, The one who is victorious and does my will to the end not just for a short period of time, but to the end. What I see here is a, a strong picture of the church of Jesus Christ that allows teachers to teach things that willingly uh, lead people into sin and justify it and say that it's okay. And I'm so concerned by the vast majority of, of teaching out there that exists that allows people, <laughs> that gives allowance for people's sin. Here, the, this woman Jezebel, who was speaking uh, on behalf of God, self-proclaimed though, if you will, was leading the people of God into sexual immorality, into food sacrificed by idols, but leading them into sin and justifying it as God says it's okay. And what we have here from the words of Jesus is to not tolerate teaching like that, is to not tolerate people like that. And as much as our culture wants to perpetuate this notion that we're to be tolerant of anything and everyone, I shared a, a number of weeks ago of how I've had so many conversations with people, so many of my friends that have addressed me and says, you know what, I love Jesus and I love his message of peace and tolerance. And that's just not in there. <laughs> in fact, he, he tells us the opposite, does he not? He says, don't tolerate sin. Right? He goes on, he says, man, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Don't live with it. God made you this way. And I'm just, I'm concerned about a church that is moving forward that doesn't call sin, sin, and doesn't actually embrace sin the teaching of Jesus to deny oneself to follow him. Those are not the popular things within society. Those are not the popular message. That's not an easy thing to do. But the reality of it is, uh, I think scripture is very clear that Christianity was never going to be popular, right? Um, man, I had it in here. Did I skip it? Did I delete it? I believe it's Matthew 16. Did I tell you to put Matthew 16 in here? No, I already said that. Mm, look at me. Do, 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 do. Awkward pause in the sermon. No, I'm trying to pull it up. Where was I going to say that? <laughs> and I love these awkward moments, don't you? You never know what's going to come out of my mouth next. Anyway. The church was never intended to be popular. It was never promised to us. Um, I actually think it's John 16, not Matthew 16. I didn't send it to you. I sent you the wrong things. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no. No. Um, it's in the Bible. Man, I am drawing a blank. You guys ever done that? It's super embarrassing, right? Yeah, it turns out I'm human. Um, the reality is, guys, uh, I, I have a lot of friends that fall into this category of, you know, identifying as LGBTQ or, or these things, people that I've witnessed to for years. I have friends inside and outside of the church that this is uh, a current battle for them in trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. And this is a conversation that is wildly 
Uh, I mean, just it's a crazy one to try to have with people. But I believe one of the church's primary mistakes in going into conversation and in going into um, going into situations with this is one where we're motivated uh, only by compassion and not by truth as well. And I say this not because we're trying to be belittle or try to demean people, but I believe to have a firm foundation in the Word of God first and believing that what Scripture says is ultimately what drives and determines us rather than our personal feeling or emotion, which can be difficult, which can be hard, but we wind up way off track. And my big concern with a lot of uh, affirmating or affirming churches, affirmating, what in the world, <laughs> affirming churches and, uh, and these different things is that it's not going to be too long before everything is permissible and nothing sacred anymore. And that's, uh, that's a scary reality that we live in. It's something that we already see happening where um, I, I, I heard statistics and things that I'm not going to share because they're going to be wrong because I didn't write them down. I hope you guys catch my heart in this. I hope that you, you understand why I'm talking about this, why we're taking a, a stance on this, is because I believe that it's important that we stay true to what God has already spoken, but that we'd also be willing to call sin what it is. Um, because if we don't, there's no real reason for us to exist. We could invite, picture us being a hospital, right? where people come in, where we have medication, where we have the means to actually address the problem. But uh, let's say it was, a, it was something that needed to be prescribed. And I could prescribe uh, medication or something like that to somebody, uh, but they had to take it for themselves. But we never actually told them there was anything wrong. Why would you just take medication if you didn't have any idea that there was something wrong? Does that make sense? I realize that's an analogy that breaks down somewhere very quickly. But the reality of it is, is that there is a problem in society. There is a problem with our culture. There is a problem with humanity at large, and it's sin. And we must be willing to address it, um, not, just, not just kind of give people a free pass because it makes us uncomfortable. Does that make sense?